first thing that I tell people is that kind of assume, unless you have the money backing of a Bonnaroo or Coachella, that you're probably going to lose money the first year and that you probably should have enough money in the bank that if the rain comes and the weather changes and, you know, all the other, you know, how, how much did I lose after 911, how much after Katrina, what other natural factors are going to come into play. And if you don't have a bank account, you better have funding and you better be, you better assume one year you're going to lose money. Second year, you might break even. Third year, if you happen to make money, then you're on a roll. And I'll just give you an example. I had a, a guy named Bruce Wheeler called me from Wheeling, West Virginia, saying he was going to do a festival. I'm like, Wheeling, West Virginia, there's a destination place there for you. Um, and how are you going to do this? And the first thing I said to him is, you're not going to do any by the first year. Because people, you're in, you're in March now, and you've got an August festival. People have already made their summer plans. They've set out vacation. Most people don't live their lives like we do. They go to work, and then they go to vacation, and they can't, you know, they have to make plans for all stuff. And on the third year, I was standing, first year, he lost so much money. And the second year, he had enough to get through. Third year, I was standing with him, and it was sold out. And it was beautiful. We were standing up on the hill in Washington. Said, Guys, you were right. The next year, he won for uh, Best Blues Festival for the Blues Music Awards and, um, and got up on stage and said, you know, this one honest agent told me what was going to happen to me, and he was right. And the other thing on that is you got to watch agents. We're sleazy by nature. And they will cheat, lie, and steal you to death. And I have been called the CarMax of agents. And I take that as, as, as a point of pride because when someone calls me, I'm going to tell them the truth within a range, but I'm going to tell them the truth because I need to have a partnership with these guys because I need their festival to be successful because I need them to call me next year and say, God, you were honest. I'm going to hire a couple more of your bands. And that's the only way we do this. So when I hear someone, and I won't use any agencies name by name, but they probably know over here that they'll, I'll hear them call me and go, but they, I've just made, you know, an inquiry about this band and they asked for blah, blah amount of money. And I'll go, they're lying. I'll tell you the truth. If you call me up, I, I keep my eye on everything. I listen to everyone. I call everyone. I know when they're lying to you, and there's no point ripping off these starters because it's, we're all in this together. We're, again, we're not covering the Bon Jovis. We're, calling the, we're covering the George Porters. My artists are in their 40s. My, my oldest artist just died at 97 a month ago. Pine Top Perkins was 97 years old and won a Grammy. I'm responsible for their life. They're artists. They're not playing this game. So we have to partner with these people to make sure that we all survive or the art dies. You know, in the art, meaning the art of music or my art of blues, which I love so much, these New Orleans guys that I have invested so much, you know, when it's George Porter has to pay his bills. He's not a rock star. You know, everyone down the line, I work with Papa Growth Funk, Andrews Osborne, Eric Lindell, uh, Voices of the Wetlands, the Iguanas, a whole list of people from New Orleans. They're never going to be on MTV. They're never going to dance with Justin Bieber on stage at the Grammys, most likely. But they are career, they're career artists and musicians. And so we have to fight this together. So how do we, how do we make sure these festivals survive? Um, I think the best thing is to go to the panels that have survived. And, uh, and also with agents that have survived through this process also, is when you started this up, what were the things that, you, that, that got you over the hump? Uh, were you successful the first year? Were you able to, you know, where, where did you go with this? Because, boy, I, had, I got stiff a lot last summer. When the economy fell and all these little, the word jam band festival, whew, and uh, you know it's some hippie that's going, woo, I'm going to make some money. And, um, and nine out of ten of them go, woo, before they get out of, out of the starting block. So, guys? Well, I've had people email me and call me and say, hey, I want to be in your business. And sometimes I'll say, well, you can buy me out or just run because it's not easy. We, we make it look easy, but it's a full-time job. Uh, the first year, I went to work in New Jersey. I'm actually an electrician, and uh, I had a little party. And from there, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, to see people dance and eat and have a great time, it's just there's nothing to it. And when you run a festival... There's no high like it. When it works, when you've got great weather, it's, you're on top of the world. Uh, the other part, I had two years where it rained both days. 
I looked at the gate and there was nobody there. And I'm second year, I'm walking around rubbing my chest and people are like, are you all right? And I'm like, yeah, it just feels better when I rub it. And I think somebody slipped me a Xanax later that day. Um, you know, it's, it's highs and lows and you gotta be able to take it. I think it really depends on the model of the festival that you're running and there's so many different models that we have up here and there's indoors and outdoors and, and different things and the kind of music that I liked, I knew you could never make money doing it in terms of running the festival, which is why I've been in the not-for-profit field. So our festival, we're a $3.4 million budget a year. We have a full-time staff of 10 people. We earn 40% of our annual budget through ticket sales, and we raise the other 60%. And that comes from a combination of individuals, corporations, uh, foundations, and a very small bit of government. And we have a staff that works year-round to, to procure all that money. So we're raising almost $1.85 million to support these things. But it, if you're going to bust kids in for free to see things, you've got you've to raise money to do that. My dad loves to joke with me and say, I see you're succeeding at being not-for-profit. <laughs> and... Um, and that's okay. That's fine because, you know, the American Cancer Society or his church or whatever is not for profit. So we have a model that's not for profit, but it's working. You have an annual budget of 3.4. You budget at the beginning of the year as long as you make that budget work. And this year we're going to make that budget work. We've had nine. It was $600,000 event uh, nine years ago. It's now $3.4 million. We had a staff of four. Now we're a staff of ten. We've had nine consecutive years of record ticket sales. More people are giving us money than ever before, and I think it's because we have a quality product. We have 42% of the people that attend the festival come from more than 200 miles away. They stay an average of 4.5 days, and they spend an average of $475 per day in our community, and we know that because we interview the patrons. We keep very careful statistics. We have to prove to the city and to the people who give us money that we're worthy of that, and a lot of times you're justifying it on the what's called economic development model, the economy. You're helping the economy of Savannah, and that's what we're doing. We have a small city. We're 130,000 people, but it's a, we use the backdrop of this historic place, Savannah, Georgia, which was spared by Sherman when he burned up most of Georgia in the Civil War, and they spared it, and it's a beautiful little place, and people like to come visit it. It's just like New Orleans, it's got an open container policy. You can walk around with a drink in your hand. People like that. And, um, and, uh, um, and so that's, that's what we have. Um, I've worked on over 100 festivals um, in the last 20 some odd years. And what I mean by that is that, you know, I've worked on, let's say, Saratoga for 15 times or at least, and a Sorry. number of other festivals multiple times as well. And a lot of the festivals that I've worked on over the years are gone. Um, they were mostly corporate sponsored events and as the sponsorship money dried up or as the corporation's goals changed uh, so went the festivals and um, it's a very interesting thing to be involved in something like that particularly jazz festivals or festivals in similar in nature that started for all of the right reasons um, and as the world changed and the economy changed and business changed uh, these companies that really kept these festivals alive um, for their own marketing and promotional community-oriented purposes, whatever it might have been, um, just decided that they were going to stop sponsoring it. And the most interesting thing about it, in, in my experiences with that, is that the festivals became a very important part of the fabric of the community in some of the cities that we were working in. And I assumed and it was actually, I'll give you two quick examples if I can. So Mellon Bank, which was a big Pennsylvania-based bank, started the Mellon Jazz Festivals in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia in the early 80s. And I worked on them all through the mid-90s and into the uh, sort of around 2000, 2001, 2002. Mellon Bank purposely sponsored those festivals, not for commercial purposes, but because they really did want to give something back to the community in, Pen in Philly and Pittsburgh and those areas. They had tens of thousands of employees, um, millions of people who were using ATM cards and, and other areas of their banking, and they just felt that it was an important thing to do in those cities. And so the community affairs department, not the marketing and promotional department, were actually managing those events. And 
Mellon merged with another bank, Citizens, and then Bank of, bank of New York got involved. And within three weeks, 25 years of uh, good work in those two cities vanished. The, the contracts were canceled, the festivals were done. And George Wayne said to me, they're over. And I said, we'll get another sponsor. And he said, nobody else will pick this up. And I said, you, I, they have to because these are such important events in these two cities. And he said, no other company has ever stepped up throughout all of these years to help support what Mellon's been doing. And, and I just don't think that there's anybody out there waiting to take this over. And he was right. I mean, they, I tried, we put out all these you know, proposals and what have you and, and request to companies, Heinz and Pittsburgh and other companies in Philly and they're gone and they've been gone ever since. Um, and so it's an interesting thing how that all plays out. And I think that um, it's a very important part of my personal experiences on how these things go. And, and there are a lot of other things, uh, events that have lasted um, you know, a long time and I think it's about the fact that we all up here, particularly whether it's for-profit or not-for-profit, are working on e what we call evergreen events. Those massive festivals, All Points West and Rothbury, burned out because the budgets were so massive and their goal going into those festivals was to make as much money as they possibly could within a two or three year model um, based on the investments that they were putting into the festivals. It was pure business calculations and after you know two years both festivals they saw this is we're done with this and they were not investing in those events for the future which is fine but that's the difference you know it's really about um, I think uh, uh, the folks up here and, and, and a lot of the things and our colleagues are really working on things that will be will be built and create and, and continue to, to build over time and hopefully be long-term events I agree with you it takes three years you can use, lose a lot of money really quickly. It's a wonderful experience. Um, but you have to be ready to be three years. And living in Asheville, there's so many people that think they want to have their own festival. Oh, yeah. And you're like, oh, God, here goes another one. And it'll get so much hype and the coolest new thing. And yeah, sure enough, then he leaves and goes to New Mexico, yeah. you know, or who, whoever it is. But um, the NEA did their first ever study this past year on festivals and the importance of festivals in our communities. And um, my LEAF and the National Black Arts Festival in Atlanta, we were chosen as the two festivals to go up to DC and report to the presidential panel. And it was so interesting because we found that most festivals will do between one and nine outreach programs in their local community. LEAF does 60 outreach programs yearly in our local community. Scott, who runs the programs here for the Jazz Fest Foundation, does God only knows how many programs in the local community here. So when you're talking about these festivals that are spending tons and tons of money, and what does it go to? How does it better the community? How does it better and have a lasting impact on the people that are coming? LEAF runs on 1.4 million, I mean, we, we have probably the smallest budget of hardly any festival out there that's been going for this long. I don't know how big your budget is, but it's, uh, yeah, okay, I would figure you and I are, we're the, we're the small crawfish in here. Yeah, <laughs> so, so but, but going back again, and thank God for people like Hugh and for Mel who really are able to work with us and figure out, and I do two, we do two festivals and 60 outreach programs on that budget. And so it's really finding, okay, who are the people and the musicians that are the right match for us and for our mission? And there, um, you know, it all comes down to, too, is that people like you guys finding that festivals are still important, whether it be in your community or your lives, that help make it. And then people like Saria, who's sitting here in the front row, she's probably out there right now, one of the best staff and festival volunteers. I don't know how many festivals you volunteer staff at, but I know at least 10 off the top of my head, but it's people like her that are out there that are really surrounding myself and other directors who are making these festivals happen. So it's a, the collaboration, I think you brought up the collaborative point, and none of us can do what we're doing without a silly amount of partners and collaborators, and it really is a group effort. And yes, the, the funding, we all would love to have some a AEG funding for sure, and imagine what we could do with that, wow. Uh, I'm, I'm not really 
qualified to speak about what problems and humps festivals have to get over to be successful, but any problems they may have, I can solve if they book my artists. <laughs> <laughs> no, my artist. Awesome. No. <laughs> so I have three, three, quick, three quick stories. Um, when I was younger, I got a job uh, for Paul Masson Vineyards, and it was a PR job, and they said, well, we have this place up in the mountain. This is in uh, Saratoga, California, um, near San Jose, and it was um, called the Paul Masson Mount Winery. It was a a venue, and they had done shows there for about 20 years. They had two series. One was called Vintage Sounds, and they had uh, uh, jazz artists, and the one was called Music of the Vineyards. And the idea was that the musicians would come and play for two days, and then an intermission, they would pour the wines, Palmasan wines. And they had pe people like uh, Stan Getz and, and um, uh, Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee, and they had uh, uh, the Tokyo String Quartet, people like that. So they said, well, what, you know, what do you think about it? And it was April, and it started, the series started in June. And so we put together something quickly, but then we realized, well, we got to get bigger. We got to get out of the business. So I started calling all the big agencies, you know, the ones you didn't mention. And they uh, uh, just uh, didn't, nobody called me back. Um, I'd call an agency every week for a year. You know, every week I'd get on the phone call, and I never got a call back. And so finally I got a hold of Ramsey Lewis, and Ramsey Lewis uh, came up and performed the next year, and he absolutely loved the place, and he had a lot of friends. So he called uh, Ray Charles, and he called Grover Washington Jr., and uh, within two years, we were doing 100 shows. Everybody from Ella Fitzgerald to uh, Miles Davis to uh, everybody. And um, so anyway, that's, uh, the, uh, it takes persistence, you know, sometimes to make things work. The sec second story is about the San Jose Jazz Festival. So the, we had a board of directors, and I'm sure people have got well-intentioned people that want to do things. And so there were 10 people on the board of directors and nobody had any money. But I was the only one, I think, with credit cards. And, and so, but they wanted to put on a jazz festival and the city had come to us and said, oh, we're gonna do a big festival and why don't you, you guys have a jazz festival? You can have the convention center for free. So we go, okay, oh, that sounds good. This was about in November. So about June, um, we were, you know, hadn't made too much progress and, and I, I woke up in the middle of the night with a sweat and like crazy thing. Well, nobody's going to come inside in June, plus the place is free, but you pay for every chair and you don't get any concession money. So we had to do something. So we said, oh, we're going to do it outside. We're going to make it free. And um, I put it all my credit cards, about $80,000, which, you know, I, I just like, I didn't tell my wife. You know, it was really bad. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and as everybody knows who does free festivals, it's all about a, is it one four-letter word. It's B-E-E-R. You know, <laughs> if you can sell the beer, you can make your festival successful. So we had about 20,000 people show up. We had two days, and, um, and then we continued it, and I got, you know, broke even, got my money back. But um, uh, three years later, we got too big, and we lost, we lost $80,000 in the festival. It wasn't on my credit cards then, but um, th what we did was we called every one of our vendors. We had paid all the musicians. Every one of our vendors and asked them to, to do it, for, uh, if we could pay them 10 cents on the dollar, and they all said yes. And then we continued on. So we, we made a big mistake, but luckily we stayed in business. And the, the last, last story is about thinking on your feet. And that's, um, I don't remember how long it was, maybe about 10 years ago. Um, we, um, we had uh, our second day uh, between us, the last, uh, the, the third and the last act. Uh, the, the, uh, we were on city power at our main stage, and, the, and we had a bunch of stages. And uh, all the power went out. And um, I didn't really know what the problem was. Was it just in the park where we were? I didn't really know. So I ran across the street to the Fairmont Hotel and I saw all these businessmen making phone calls. So I realized it was a much bigger problem than just in the area. And the whole West Coast had blacked out. So what we did was we, I sent somebody to one of the other stages, which was Latin. And we had a big generator there. And I said they can just go acoustic. And uh, we brought the, main st the, the generator to the main stage. And um, we hooked it up. It took us about half an hour. We were about 30 minutes late getting the last act on. And then we asked the police department if they could give us an hour extra on our curfew. So we actually made money off the deal because we sold more beer in, in the end. <laughs> so, but anyway, so sometimes, you know, you, these things aren't all that easy. But if you think on your feet and you make quick decisions, you can, you can, you can pull, pull a miracle out of, of something that could be a disaster.